Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Michael Okreke. I welcome you to my YouTube channel where we are getting started with modeling. So I'm making a series of videos on getting started with modeling. And I have already done a first video on stent modeling. So this is a continuation of that previous video on stent modeling. So this particular one is modeling two, and I'm going to be focusing on analysis of results from simulations of a stent after it has been deformed and expanded by a balloon and the balloon has recalled. So what you see here in this right in front of you is the result from that simulation. But I just want to, before we go ahead, point you to the other video where I showed you that. So this is on YouTube currently, STEM Modeling 1, and it's on geometric designs. So please, you need to look at this first part of this series of videos on stent modeling to be able to understand what we're trying to do with the second video. So here we are in my desktop containing Abacus. So I'm no more using the student version of Abacus. So this is a full version that I have access to. So what we're going to do with this, so if you look again at what we have, so this is our stent model. And the stent has this green part being the balloon. So the balloon is going to expand and blow up the stent such that the angioplasty, coronary angioplasty procedure could be completed. So this is what we are going to be looking at. So just run through some of the information that we already have from the previous video. So we imported the stent model from a CAD a version. It was created in CAD, we imported it. And in that video, we created the balloon and centered the balloon if you look at the assembly mode, you will center the balloon right in the middle so that it will be able to expand and create the kind of deformation we wanted. So we also created a property for the balloon. So the material properties of the balloon was 0.9 gigapascal and 0.33. It was considered elastic. You could improve that by making it hyperelastic. But for this simulation, we are working with only an elastic material model for the balloon. So the stent is a bioresorbable stent. So the properties of the stent basically has a density of 1430 kilogram per meter cubed, elasticity of 1.727 gigapascal. So this was extracted from an experiment that I actually did with my students um, to get this uh, modulus of 1.727 gigapascal. It was a tensile test experiment on a dog bone specimen. The Poisson ratio for most polymers is usually around 0.4, so we assume that we didn't actually measure that. The use stress we also extracted from our own experiments on a PLA sample, um, so it was 60 uh, megapascal. So that, that was that, and then obviously we tried to create the S sections. So for the stent, it was modeled as a continuous, solid, homogeneous, continuous material. The stent, we created different variants of how we can because, sorry, the balloon. The balloon basically is a very thin membrane element, so you can model it as a surface element or a, a shell element or whatever. So we created that. And the actual one that we used, if you look at the section assignment, was we treated the balloon as a surface element. So because it's essentially a surface element, so this was it. The kind of material was surface, so we'll, and, and that was what we used. And after we've done all that, we meshed the model, so in meshing the balloon, we went ahead to specify the kind of element. So if you click here and look at what we specified as a type of element, it was a surface element, not surprise, for the balloon. For the stent, so if I minimize that and look at the stent, so for the stent, the stent what kind of, this is a stent, so if you look at the meshing, if I click, double click on the mesh, so what type of element did we specify in the previous video? So it was a continuum element, basically, a 3D stress continuum element of variance, so the, the yeah, continuous element. So, and that's that. So we meshed it using you know, tetrahedral elements for the stent and all that. So if, please, if you watch that video, you'll get more information about some of these things. But I'm just kind of running through that so that you, know, you can see what we have. So we created two instances, one for the stent and another one for the balloon within the assembly module. And there are certain features that we created 
to help us with the analysis. So if I switch to the assembly module, so there was, of course, the cylindrical um, no, Cartesian coordinate system, which is a default, comes with Apacus, there's not, we can do that. Now, we created some reference, reference points, some reference axis, a reference point right in the middle here to help us to identify the center. We use that to position the stand and all that. So we're going to use that. Most importantly, we created an assembly cylindrical coordinate system. So this was what we are going to use to impose loading on the structure. So we did that in that previous video. We created surfaces as well, the inside surface of the balloon, the outside surface of the balloon, the inside surface of the stand, and the outside surface of the stand. We isolated those different surfaces. The step analysis that we used for that study was um, a static general step. However, we switched on nonlinear geometric um, feature because it's a finite deforming system. So we need NLGO to be switched on. So we did that in that video. So we didn't do much with the history output. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more. We positioned this structure so that if I show you the other view, so if you position it this way, and turn off perspective so you could see that our displacement is radial okay in the one direction one direction in a cylindrical coordinate system is basically the radial direction according to the reference frame that we've chosen so again we should i took time to explain how this is done in the previous video so we got to the point where we wanted to submit okay the other thing we did was we specify some kind of con contact so interaction so our contact which is the balloon and the stent, the kind of contact between them. So the balloon outer surface and the stent inner surface experience a kind of contact. Um, we did that also in that video. So all that is specified. I think we also specified the interaction property being a structure so that the contacting faces will experience the equation of friction of 0.2, just a very small friction as the balloon makes contact with the, with the stent research in literature has shown that it doesn't really affect the simulation that much okay so before we make the submission so there are a few things that we didn't do in that video which i'm going to start off with in this video so that we can do that right away so the first thing is in the assembly module or maybe let's go to the parts so the stent the stent design we need to create some set of reference points that we are going to use for extracting, analyzing how the structure is going to behave, in, in, you know, how, for analyzing its structural parameters, things like elastic recall, longitudinal retraction, and uh, for shortening, dog boning, all those features that are used in characterizing stents. We need to be able to do that. So I'm going to make a third video still on this series where we are going to just show how that can actually be done. I'll just go right away to show you what we we're going to do here. So I'm going to create further set of points on this structure, further set of points on this structure. So let me get it into this YZ view so that I'm looking down from the top. So within the set, we create the reference points, but as a whole, as a whole, so you've got reference point one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to delete that because I've had to think about that since I made that video and I want to do this in a better way. So if we do this, I'm going to have ref top, the reference point at the top. So I'll select that point, hold and select that point. So I select that by itself. So I'm going to find another reference point bottom, which are the ones at the base. So I select that and I select that. Okay. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to put this straight, straight again, turn off perspective, and then look at these references. So these are the ones at the top, okay? Correctly identified. If I look at the one, I'm going to find a point in the middle, which I'm going to use to compare. Probably in the middle here, compare on the two sides. So I'll double click on set, so reference middle, no more on the geometry, but now on the nodes. I want to extract it based on the nodes rather than the geometry. So I've got one, two, three, one, two, three. So the middle position, one, two, the, the middle position here. And we're probably looking at something in this window, 
just somewhere around here. So maybe if we select that point, press down shift, okay, and then you do the same on the other line. So we're going to use a point that is somewhere here. So one, two, three. So let's calculate it. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So somewhere in the middle here is what we should be looking for. So I select that point and the other one is still there. So, so let's check whether this is correct, whether they are kind of sort of aligning properly. So they're almost aligning sort of properly. Yeah, so we can we can make do with this, especially if we turn off perspective. So they're sort of almost in the middle. So we're going to work with that. But for your own sake, you may have to be very accurate in terms of how you determine what these two points are, would, would be. Okay, so now once you've, you've done that, you turn off perspective. So we've got those three reference points. So we need to create a corresponding history output for them, corresponding history output. So we'll move away from those things and go all the way to history. So I'm going to create the first history. If I double click on history output request, so double click here, then it gets you this window. So I'm going to call it the history history top for the top reference node continue no more on the whole model but just on the set and my set will be the top ref so the reaction that i'm looking for for making this are basically the coordinates and um, reference frames essentially the coordinate one two and three that's really all we need nothing else so if we go to the coordinates so here under volume thickness and coordinates so you see chord, so if you select them, then it gives you all the three. Because we want to use the coordinate positions of these nodes to work out what the other parameters associated with this deformation, structural parameters would be. So we'll double click there again, and then we'll have history button. So for the bottom case, again, I can type directly core one, core two, core three, to, for the three coordinate positions associated not on the model, but on a subset here, which will be the bottom, okay? History bottom, so the set would be the ref bottom that we defined previously. Okay, so now that we've done that, we'll do the third case, which is history, um, the history middle, okay? The history middle. So the set we're looking for is the middle set, and again, I can go type core one, core two, coordinate three, coordinate position three for X, Y, Z. So we've got the reference nodes all in place. The other thing that we need is to fix this model. At the moment, we've got a displacement, so it knows what to do, it can expand. But what are we going to do with its displacement? Okay, it needs to be fixed. It needs to be a fixed point so as to preclude free body motion so the system cannot just float in space so we need to have a reference point where it's actually fixed in space and we're going to probably fix it at this point lp1 but i don't want to fix it directly i want to fix it to a different point so what i'm going to do now is to create a reference point so if i orient this this way okay so i'm going to create a point that i'm going to tie to that center and then apply my loading directly at that point so tools reference so what point do we want that reference to be i've already checked it so this is the reference that i i used but you can work out what it is so somewhere something that is close to this so minus three minus three minus three would work you could try a different number maybe 10 10 10 minus 10 minus 10 something that is just not associated with the model something that is at a distance somewhere either here here there or there wherever so that's my reference and it's my reference point too. So I'm going to tie that reference to the known reference so that when I apply load here, it will affect what happens there. So we're going to create a constraint. So, and this constraint will be reference point one to two, uh, maybe coupling. You can use kinematic coupling so that if we fix that displacement, it will also be fixed. So we could all, let's use it just a simple tie. Okay, so if we use a tie, it's a nodal region 
What is the master? The master will be that reference point two done. Another nodal region, what will be the other master? Something there, but why not let's pick it from the set? Okay. So if I turn this around, so you can see what it is. So this I could say highlight which set. So M set one is probably the right one. M set three is different. M set two is different. M set five is different. Set two different. So really M set one is the name of that particular set. So we'll continue. So we've got a constraint which is a tie constraint that ties the behavior of that point to here okay and then we'll click OK so if I double click on that okay so you could see that this is tied to that now the next thing we need to do is to create a displacement sorry we need to create fix that point so that whatever is fixed here is translated to that point so I'm going to create here and say fixed anchor point it won't be a loading step, it will be an initial loading step. It will be also fixed in all directions, so symmetry would work. So you say, which region do you want to fix? So I could look at the different point and find which one. Maybe set M set six, highlighted there, okay? And we want the encastre, which means we are fixing it in all possible directions. Okay, encastre. So this fixed, point means that it's also anchored to this so this structure is it's almost like if you think about it it's like a rope that holds this in place so as this expands it's not going to float away so and this is really essential because without that then you have free body movement the structure will just float away in space and the simulation probably never run so this is what we have the other thing that i think i, I would like to draw your attention to is this expand contract so we started with 0 0.5 to 1 but there is no need to deflate this structure completely to zero, the amplitude to zero. So we could just, to conserve computational time, we could try 0.3. Because at 0.3, the balloon would have completely left, you know, uh, moved away from the stent. So there's no need to keep running it until that um, unloading comes to zero. So once the, it detaches from the stent, then you stop the simulation without wasting more time. So. Although in the previous video I said up to 1, we haven't thought about it, go to 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, just whatever percentage that you want to stop the simulation without having to take more computational time. That is what you need to do. So we're going to then, having done all that, I believe we're ready to run the model. Okay, so I'll double click here and set it to run. So the, the model, it, I'm calling it okay. Maybe stent are uh, your stent one simulation one job one. So something you know. So this is the name I've been using for this design of stent. I call it IU stent. So um, we're going to work with that, click continue and then OK. So we can then submit that job to run. And what we're looking for when we submit it to run is to see if everything we have specified in the model is correct. So it's submitted here and it says the job input file has been submitted for analysis and it's going to take a while for it to run because it's not a straightforward model. There are a lot of complexities associated with it. So it's going to take a while. Um, so what we're going to do, what I'm going to do while the work is running is you could monitor what's going on with this simulation. So you bring down this monitor window and check what is happening. Okay, if there is any warning is giving you about what is not working well, some areas is saying are over constrained, um, would that affect the way the model would run? So you check all that, it's just a warning, it doesn't mean things are already breaking. So you look at the log files, so it has started, and you're watching this total time through frequency to see how that will build up. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video so that we can wait for it to run after it's finished running. I will show you. Our results, we've got a result from the simulation. So it shows here. So what I'm going to do is to animate this, to set it to animate so that you can see what is going on. So we start off from the beginning. So it's animating and 
The balloon is expanding, opening up the stent onto its maximum point, and then it gradually comes back and deflates. So this is the simulation. This is what's happening. So the balloon opens or gets the maximum and then deflates. So we're going to study the different steps involved in this. So if I go back to right at the beginning, so this is where the model was set up and it starts building up in stress. So if we move, so I'm going to use this slider to check. So what's happened? So we keep going, keep going, keep going until I want you to watch what happens. So at about 0.45, Okay, so somewhere around here you get 0.446. So this is the maximum point. Remember, the way we set up the model was that when you get to the maximum, the maximum um, es 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 expansion, it will be at 0.45 seconds. So this is at 0.45 seconds according to the time step you are using, you are using. And so the balloon is fully expanded up to a radial expansion in distance of 2.25 millimeters. Um, that we are using remember the internal diameter of the balloon was two millimeters so about two millimeters so when it expands fully to this point so it's over 150 percent radial expansion at this fully expanded state so i'm going to switch the stress history from stress to plastic strain because this is a really important feature the plastic strain because what keeps the stent in position is this plasticity the, the locking of plastic strain so when the load on when the stent is unloaded, this plastic strain is what needs to be hold, that holds the stent in place and keep it within the arterial walls until healing is completed, until you know full potency is restored in the stent. So we, we need to see the accumulation of this plastic strain. So we go back right to the beginning. So right at the beginning, there was no plastic strain at all, and then that plastic strain start building up, building up. See, you get to that maximum point of point 0.46 or 0.5, you see the accumulation of plastic strain. And it's really very interesting how it is formed. It's always at these anchor points where these plastic strains exist. Okay, so if I zoom out, so you can see there's a uniform distribution of this plastic strain across the stents, which is very good. So there is no concentration of plastic strain. So that is really good because it tells you that the stent is radially expanding in a uniform way and the distribution of this plastic strain will also be uniform. That means within the arterial walls, it will also stay in place uniformly across the whole structure. So this is a good representation of what the stent is doing and we can see that from the plastic strain. So if we look again at another feature, which is the displacement how much is the magnitude of displacement you see in this structure and this becomes really very interesting so across most of the stands there's a uniform displacement of about 2.25 2.23 2.25 remember we impose a radial expansion of 2.25 so according to this um, legend so if i increase so link viewports uh, viewport annotation options so I can increase the level, the size of this legend so that we can see it more cl much clear clearly. Okay, so good. So you can see somewhere, most of it is in this kind of yellowish, almost greenish point. So it's around 2.25 and 2.5. So within this region, this is what we expect. But there's something happening here. And that is at this corner, there is a significant uh, distance, almost 3.348 millimeters. So there's a lot of movement happening at those edges, not happening in the center. And this is really a, a good thing to see. So if you look here again, it gives you a better picture of what's happening here. So particularly on the bottom side, if you look at the bottom side, it says that there's a lot of movement at those tips here, and then it goes back down almost kind of a wave-like manner. And really, the anchor points where the plastic strains are being accumulated, so if we switch back to the plastic strain, so these are the anchor points. So these are also the points where you are getting this plasticity, this kind of movement, this kind of almost um, sinusoidal movement, sine, sine, sine wave movement. 
So if I continue showing this result in terms of displacement, so this is suggesting to us that this stent shows some form of, albeit very small, dog burning. The distal and proximal regions, the top and the bottom region, is expanding more than the central region. Um, and that leads to dog boning. It's a common future you see with most stents, um, but it's not a good future. You don't want a lot of dog boning because dog bone, excessive dog boning will lead to arterial damage. And then also they will not hold the stent properly, the artery properly during this angioplastic procedure. So plastic procedure. So this is, this is not a good thing. But already we begin to see by just observing the displacement, you can begin to see what is happening. So we're going to continue slightly. So if I keep moving this, then we get to point five. So this, at this stage, you're holding the stent. Remember our, our, our loading step is 0.45 loading. Then from 0.45 to 0.55 is holding in place and then unloading even to 0.3, um, you know, to almost zero. And this is, so at this point, not much really happens between 0.45 and 0.5. It's just holding it in place. In practice, this is essential because it helps you assess things like creep. How does the stent behave? Does it creep when you hold this load in place? Does the artery start collapsing at this holding stage? Because in the end, you really want this to happen. So for viscoelastic structures, structures that are like polymers, this is a critical feature that you need to assess to understand the effect of creeping, creep or stress relaxation on the structure as the load is held in place. So we stop at Point five, five, and then after that, if you keep progressing, you see the balloon is collapsing, collapsing somewhere around point seven. So it comes out completely, and then there's no more load, and then you go back to the end. So what you see here in the displacement is the balloon has completely gone out, gone back to a near zero position. Okay, no radial distance again. But most of the stent has stayed in place. You're getting about 1.953 millimeters. So it's expanded as far as 2.25, 2.25. And when the stent was removed, it, recont it contracted, it recoiled back to a radial positioning of 1.95, nearly two. You know, which is quite good, which is quite good. So nearly 100% um, expansion. So. This is a point where once the balloon is removed, this position, the stent, has enough plastic stress in it to hold the artery in position. And this is really the objective of using a stent within a simulation. So if we go back to plastic strain, so you can see the accumulation of the plastic strain is still evenly distributed in the structure. And this is what is locking the stent in place, allowing it to be able to hold the artery during the healing process. Uh, and this is what is really called this um, restoration of patency, a term that doctors use to describe, you know, the outcome when a stent is put in place in, in within, you know, a coronary artery. So patency has been restored because now the stent is still held in place by this plastic stress and then you can retract the balloon and then send home the patient and hopefully everything will be fine. If this stent were made of a steel material, or a metallic system, it will probably stay in place for the to, you know, duration of the life of the, of the patient. But this, there is a research going on on bioreservable polymers, bioreservable polymers, uh, which means that they can actually dissolve after between 6 and 24 months after insertion. So they stay in place, allow for patency to be restored, and then they can be retracted. So this is also the, the, the outcome. This is what really shows us what's happening the fact that this plastic strain is holding this stent in place. Um, and, and we can also look at what stress levels there are. So if you look at the stress, okay? So the main maximum stress in the structure, anywhere you have a spike in stress is 134, 135 megapascal. But the critical stresses are more, these stresses that are kind of evenly distributed across the structure. So maybe the blue and the orange, lemon, lemon ones. And that's probably around blue and somewhere around here, maybe 56, about 60, okay? Something like that. So that's good because we're using a bioreservable polymer, which is PLA, and its yield stress around 60. So within the threshold of its yield stress, it can still hold the stent in place. 
without failing. So this numerical study already shows that there's a possibility of this happening. Of course, in practice, there are other factors that, that, that come in. But the initial insight we're getting from this shows that there is an even distribution of stress that probably has the tendency to hold this stent in place uh, without the material failing at any point. We can look at other features, something like the, um, the media of principal stress, which is like an average stress distribution across the structure, an average, the average stress in the structure. And we see most of it is green, and green is about, again, like I said, 60, 67 megapascal. So stress, the stress state in the structure is in that threshold that will allow us to approve that this stent is able to, to be made from this PLA. Uh, but we need to be careful because you have to allow for certain factor of safety in your design. So that's really all that I want to show with this. Clearly, the next level in analysis of this stent is to look at um, structural parameters, the kind of parameters that people are interested in, things like radial recall, elastic recall, for define this dog bone that I'm speaking about here. So we need to do that to be able to complete this analysis of the result. So there will be, please watch out for the next video, which will be STEM modeling number three, where I show how you can model these radial recall parameters so that we can have objective numbers that tell us, you know, what this stent is doing. And then we can compare these numbers, those structural parameters with maybe commercially available stents or com competitive competing stents. So the third video will be on the structural parameters associated with then quantifying them and please do look out for that and if this is the kind of content that you're interested in please do subscribe to my channel and uh, and um, please click the notification button so that when videos for that videos like the one i'm talking about which is these elastic recall uh, structural parameters when i make them then you'll be the first to know about it thank you for you know for watching so far and for your interest in what I present on this channel and I hope you have a lovely day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.